Good evening, everybody, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in to Free to Heal. We are a platform, a group we meet every week, um, formerly incarcerated, loved ones, children, stakeholders, everybody that's been touched by the criminal justice system. And we've been doing it now for a little over a year, and I wanted to start giving a perspective on the discussions that we're having, giving some context. So we're gonna be doing it a little bit different. I'll be uh, pointing out certain things to you and allowing you to, to listen in on our discussions. Tonight, we were blessed to have the perspective of one group of people we've never had before. And that is the perspective of a corrections officer. Uh, her name is Christina Havis and Ms. Havis is actually an associate producer in the entertainment industry, and she and I are going to work together on some projects. But she came to give her perspective on a career that she had for several years, and uh, we will have her to introduce. She had an amazing journey, a very unique journey into corrections office work, officer work. Her life as she will tell you, and you will see, was not designed for her to be in corrections. It was actually designed for her to be an inmate, as she puts it. So it's a very unique journey, and I'm looking forward to you hearing her story and how she became involved in corrections. And like I say, it's just a unique journey that I hope that you enjoy. Okay, everybody, welcome to Free to Heal. And so we are blessed tonight to have a guest, and I'm going to allow her to introduce herself um, and um, and welcome her to this conversation and Free to Heal right here. And here we go. Oh, ain't that You can start where I started. I came to LA in '93 in third grade. Um, my mother was involved. In entertainment. And I want you to turn to so yeah. that people can see you. Uh huh. My mother was involved in entertainment. Uh, she was managing Tia and Tamara and the music group. Uh, so when I moved out here from Vegas, uh, she took me away because we were in the street and Owen. Uh, Vegas in the 80s and 90s was the wild, wild west. Uh, so in an attempt to pull me away from that environment, she moved me out to L.A. Um, and I spent most of my time out here in Diamond Bar, where I met my best friend in eighth grade. Um, by 16, I was kicked out on the streets, and I was living in my car my last two years of high school. Um, <clears throat> I ended up still graduating, uh, hustling on the streets, but... I was in the streets with my family who were like creators of a lot of the large gangs in Las Vegas. Right. And at this point, uh, my uncle was going on 40 years pimp. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I had the perspective of living the Hollywood life and that good life, but then I was homeless at 16. Mm -hmm. So I, I had still a lot of those, still, those foundations that still had me getting up and going to school every day. But I spent my last year and a half sleeping in the car, um, sleeping wherever I could at the park. Um, graduated, hustled, and somebody gave me a personality test online. It was like, take this test and we'll tell you what kind of job you'll be good at. Uh, they're like, yeah, your personality is pretty bad. You might do good in law enforcement. Or oh, shut up. Like corrections. <laughs> I was a phone sex operator. Okay. I was working at Starbucks. I was bouncing down my club as a female bouncer donating plasma, just whatever I could do just to kind of survive and eat. That's what I did. Um, I took this random test and it told me I should do law enforcement. And in that test, you know how you put your email in sometimes, the websites? I guess I did that and it was an email for like University of Phoenix to go to college. Uh -huh. So within like two weeks, they sent me an email saying, you know, come sign up. I just kind of went and lost. Uh huh. I'm a right. Lost street kid. Right. I ended up signing up for college and randomly started to go to college. Um, I got the interview to test for law enforcement. I couldn't do one push up, so I had to. I had to. And just trying to make money, whatever job I could get, I'm, I'm taking it. So I ended up testing for law enforcement and getting fired. But my uncle was in the prison for murder. 
I had two cousins in the other male facilities. So there's only one facility in the state of Nevada that I can go to because all my family was already right. there. <laughs> um, so they ended up sending me to Florence McClure Women's Correctional Center, which is the only women's prison in the state of Nevada. And unfortunately, all the ladies who smoked dope with my auntie back in the day were in the prison. All the people that I went to high school with that were disappearing were in prison. So when I walked on the prison yard, it was like camp. These are some of the topics that we discussed tonight that I think are fascinating. There is no need for corrections officers to bring their ego to work. I have been honored. I was honored by a uh, captain in the Los Angeles Police Department who had me to come in and speak to the graduating classes of their elite division called Metro. He had me to speak to two graduating classes to explain to them how to police the community and make it most effective. And one of the things that uh, comes up in this discussion that you'll see is that there's no need for them to bring ego. One of the ways that I explained it to the, the Metro classes were, this is not a whose dick is longest conversation. When you stop a person on the street, we already know that you're in charge. We already know that one thing from you can ruin our entire lives. This exchange, so we already know who's in charge. Most people, particularly people of color, are aware that our lives could end. No matter how minor the encounter is, it can end our lives, literally. So. There's no need, and if, if police officers, the they're taught de-escalation, but oftentimes it's their ego that doesn't allow them to use de-escalation tactics. And that is what causes a lot of problems and results in police brutality. It was like, Chris, where you been? So there was, I'll be my experience because I walked on a yard where I knew most of the population. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so my experience was really different. It was more so of sitting down and saying, what do we what do, we do? Like, what do we, like, how do we end up here? So my relationship with my inmates was wonderful. I love them all because I recognize I was literally one step away from, from being, being them. You know what I mean? And in Nevada, most of the population come from out of state to create crime. Mm. So in our in our prison system, it was all hybrid. Yeah. Nobody was from where you know from Vegas. It was L.A., San Diego. So the population was mixed. Uh -oh. um, and most of the women who are in prison in Nevada are there for prostitution related offenses. Mm. You're not going to go to prison for doing prostitution in Nevada. It's not a felony. But if you do the the robbery. Ah. Uh -huh. So a large part of my population, I was 70% were prostitution related. Oh, wow. And so a lot of mothers and daughters and girls. So for me, going into work every day was like I had, a, I was there, I saw them with my own kids. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. You know, in California, you can work in a prison system if you know people. You can't work. If somebody you can, you can. They just have to send you to another if you really know you're right they'll put you in another prison or another yard and, and you can't go to that yard or they'll move the prison no they move us yeah they'll move, they'll they'll move they'll the move person us. so i did that in for the state level for six years in las vegas um the experience was what it was. My job was literally just to go home to my kids every night, make sure that everybody was safe. I was the type of officer, I just really don't care about what you do, I don't care about your hustle. Just make sure it's a clean, easy, safe, you know, shift for me. Um, but eventually it came to the point where I wasn't, I was, I felt like I was part of the problem and I wasn't helping out in any kind of way, so I left. This one right here convinced me to come to California um, to enter in entertainment sell my house. So I left, came out here, but I wasn't ready to leave law enforcement. Um, the security of the paycheck was why I was there. And I ended up transitioning to the feds in Riverside. Mm. So I got out of the um, 
uniform position and I went more into a transition position. So my job for another three years was the bus and sitting it down and saying, okay, day one, let's get an ID. Mm -hmm. First of you know, this is a cell phone. This is <laughs> right. Like, you've been sitting down for 15 years, you know, this is a cell phone, this is how we get on the bus. So I went in, uh, into a transition position as a transition officer. So I would teach classes, how to do interviews, how to dress for jobs, uh, how to fill out a resume. I did that a couple more years, and, and actually my inmates were like, Miss Havis, just like, like, your personality is way too big. Like, all, all I'm doing is cracking jokes in here. So it was actually an inmate who helped me the resignation letter to quit. Um, I mean, law enforcement, because I, just, I was a part of just a system that wasn't helping anything. You know what I mean? My first inmate that I had, she was a 17-year-old girl. She jumped... Uh, Stole some shirts from a store with her whole girls and got to a fight with the security officer. And because it was a group of them, they gave him the gang enhancement right. at 17. But she was a smart ass. All the other girls pled out. She decided to fight the case. She's the only one who went to jail. Yeah. But at 17, she, got, she had to sit down, violate it, and turned into a prostitute while she was in prison. So I started to see this cycle of like kids coming in for petty shit and learning how to become criminals inside the prison system. And that's when the disconnect happened. I, I understand. I can make sure everybody's safe every single night and everything is smooth. But I, I stopped yelling and it's cracking in so many ways. I lost the passion. I never did. So I ended up leaving um, to pursue entertainment full time. And my first client was this gentleman right here as his talent manager and music. And then a year into me quitting and us in his music career, we had to go. So he's just coming home seven months ago, and now we're here. For law enforcement, first job at entertainment, as the director of development and theatrical talent manager for a global talent management company. The LA was to scout, manage, and develop. And I like this program because you don't, you can, you can have a, a case or a felony on you in the entertainment. Down, down, being an operator, writing, gaffer, all those positions are available to you guys, to us, and they're not going to hold what happens. So, and, and um, actually, I um, met Christina because she is actually. She is actually um, the associate producer on the documentary that I'm executive producing, which is a documentary on Congresswoman, former Congresswoman Diane Watson. And that is how I met Christina. And we were doing a, um, a walkthrough of a facility that we're going to use to film um, a, a, a short film. Yes. And, um, and it just came out. And so my director for the film... It work. she's what my director for the film is um a um she's one of these she's bougie to her core okay and we accept her like she is but she's like oh, the, the prison people and and I'm like you gonna have to get over that because that's our and then I found out that that was her population too that she likes to serve so um so in any event um. You know, we just have the same two loves, entertainment and the prison population and reentry. And so I'm super excited that um, we're doing this short film. We're going to film it sometime between March and May um, will be an actual um, uh, full on production at that time. We're in pre-production right now. Um, I'm excited about it, but I, I again, I wanted um, to have, and I want to open the floor for questions. I want, um, and I want you guys to um, to ask whatever questions you want. I've cleared this with Christina. With it. There's no questions that are off limits. She's oh, c capable of handling her own, and if she don't want to answer, she'll tell you, whatever it is. Um, but the purpose for Free to Heal is to have insights from as many stakeholders or as many people involved and that are touched. And I don't really know of anybody in our communities that are not touched 
by the criminal justice system in one way or another. Um, and so um, that's, I wanna again, open up the floor for those kinds of questions. And, um, and I wanna say uh, to the gentleman here, welcome home, welcome home. That's right, we're glad you're home. Uh, glad you could be here to join us tonight. Thank you for coming, and um, and let's let's open it up. Let's let's have a conversation. Let's talk. Who wants to? Have, who got a question? Who wants to say something? Go ahead, Mr. Steffens. Yeah, uh, my name is Willie Steffens, and my question to Miss Christine is that she didn't seem like any type of female officer that I had ran into at Pelican Bay, because the female officers there was candid to the male officers there at the facility. And they was like hardcore. And I don't see that in her. So I was wondering, how did she make it through the system of correction officer for six years? At another point in our discussion tonight, there was a point, a discussion, great insight shared into how the institutions operate and what motivates them to make certain decisions that they make? There are things that things that go on in the lives of the correction staff that causes them to make decisions. And we're going to get a chance to take a look at the things that they understand and the things that uh, the former inmates in our group, as well as the uh, former corrections officer can tell you that the the normal public, the, the public at large doesn't know that decisions are made based on these kinds of conversations. So I encourage you to, to watch this with uh, this particular segment with uh, great interest because most people don't know that this happens. Easy. Everybody's a human and treat people like people. You know what I mean? When I, I, I in my unit, I had never had a fight on my shift the whole time I was a CEO. Wow. And, and if there was an issue that happened when I was off, it was taken care of by my population because I gave everybody the, the freedom to make choices. When I came in the room, we could have a good day or a bad day, but that's up to everybody in this room together. You know what I mean? I didn't come in there trying to swing my, my, my nuts. To, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not nobody's mother. How can we, how can I get home safe to my kids at the end of my shift? Right. You know what I'm saying? And how can I not go to your house and fuck up your house? Because I can audit you. You know what I mean? There's tools. They don't give you, they don't, we don't have tools or weapons in the prison because you guys, or it can be taken away. Right. You know what I mean? Right. The only tool that I have is my mouthpiece. Mm. I just want to go home. I want to make sure everybody's straight. How can we do this and be smooth about it? You see, I'm a negotiator. Right. I'd walk in by myself with 125 in my unit by myself. Let's have a good day. You want a potluck? You want to do nails? You want to share food? We can do that, but we need to make sure that the bare minimums are met. No, you know I want to answer. Yes, sir. No, I see. I, 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 I just want you to know I saw you. you I, I don't need that. Did you carry a taser or anything? No. There's no weapons. There's no, there's no, I'm not, this, when the police officers used to come into the prison, they would get nervous. You know what I mean? Because they, they, they can't, they don't have the tools. My only tool is this. I have to be able to talk to you, communicate. That's why now working at entertainment, I can sell anything, baby. You know what I mean? Like if, if I can get some my population to behave and feel like it's their idea to behave and not to have a bad day, then I can convince anybody to work. You know what I'm saying? So for me, mouthpiece is my tool. Yeah, well, I noticed that male convicts are different than women convicts. So I was just wondering, had you ever had the opportunity to work with male convicts. Oh yeah, of course. Women are worse than men. I would prefer to work on a men's yard over a women's yard any day of the week. How so? You said, why? How so women are harder oh, than I men? I'd love to tell you that, okay? <laughs> yes, women are extremely emotional, okay? I can go on to a men's yard and you know what time to get up every day to make up your bed and you're gonna do it because you don't want my attention. You want me to come make my rounds and get out your hair. You know what I'm saying? If you got, if, if they're doing all their shady shit, their best interest is to get me in and out. So they're going to handle their business because they don't want no smoke. The girls are emotional. Why? Why? I, I, why? It's, it's, it's a lot of questioning and emotional needs that you have to get through just to get simple things done. Um, and because women are more free with sexuality, there's a lot more drama. I saw a girl get her face slit from ear to ear. You know what I'm saying? Over some girlfriend relationship stuff. So the women are, are more emotionally taxing than the men. 
when men just want us to go on about our business. And I'm okay with that. You know what I mean? I just want to go about my business too. Right, because the issue for you was you were just this, this was a job. This wasn't some passion that you grew up with that you wanted to be some, you know, corrections officer. You didn't wake up one day and just decide I that this was to go to prison every day. Yeah. Marine, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. When I, when I have to go and get searched down every single day and the gates closed behind me, I'm in prison too. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? My goal is to get home. Y'all I just want to get home. You know what I mean? How can we do this smoothly? Yeah, well, you know, most women in, in the state prison are bitches. Most women <laughs> outside of prison. You know, okay. but I'm, I'm, <laughs> right. I'm told, look, look. buddy. And, and now, <laughs> yeah, once they get mad at you, they tear up yourself. <laughs> they they write you up you on know, the bogus bullshit. So what, what, uh, and this is my question. What is it about the the ego, because you guys know y'all want to step away from being in our place. I was locked up with seven of my other cousins. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of us locked up at the same time, and all of us had locked up. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to two. Uh, six of us got out. But the thing is, every time a female come on, like you get guys that come on, they got attitude like you. Mm -hmm. Hey, man, come on, let's make this a clean ship. I just want to get in go out because I got a hangover from last night. The women come on and it's like it's this special uh, like they tell the women you have to put on this special mask because mm -hmm. if you don't they're going to run over you. What's, mm -hmm. what's the, the ideology about that? There was a very very a great discussion about what can happen when a corrections officer that chooses to treat the inmates like people, when they function, how, how the other corrections officers, the ones that have been hardened, the ones that have been there for a long time, the ones that outlast even some of the inmates, they've been there forever and they don't want things to change, their response to a corrections officer that treats the inmate like a human, just like a human, is in a lot of instances to, to get them removed from the location because it is in their financial interest for things to be chaotic and there to be separation by race. We got to remember for anybody that's watched and may have caught this in some of our previous recordings is that it was the institutions that began to separate inmates by race that created the huge racial conflict. They encouraged it in the institutions and they did this with our tax dollars. So it's Interesting to hear the conversation as to how the other corrections officers respond to corrections officers that try to make it not a great thing because nobody believes that inmates did a crime and they shouldn't be punished for it. That's not what I haven't met anybody that believes that people shouldn't be punished for punished for crime, including criminals. But there's a difference between a punishment for crime and being dehumanized and having your mental health challenged and, and trying to be torn apart as a person that is in the system that's embedded and it's been cultural for, for years and years and years. So that was a, um, a interesting conversation. Like in the training of that. As far as training, the training, the only thing they teach you in training is just to be aware of what they call content. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, it's just the rules on physical touch. You know, women can't pat down and vice versa. Men can't pat down women. Other than that, each officer walks in with the same mentality as each inmate. How are you going to do your time? You know well, what I mean? Well, you know, it's funny in the state pen. I, when I first started, women all was on the gun rail. They weren't allowed on the ground. Mm -hmm. And I remember when they, they put the first women 
you know, could they protest? And <clears throat> did they put them on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And all the cops, uh, I mean, they were complaining like big time. They said, I was just, so they put a bitch on the ground. They sent them down to the shower, one was showering, you know, just do everything they could. Yeah. But then they would, they would say, all this shit, but let one of them inmates hit you or scare the shit out of you. Them motherfuckers beat you to death. Yeah. <laughs> Am I lying? No. 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 Yeah, you mean you mean the fee, you what, what you're saying is that the female corrections officers would do do you real harm? Is that what you say? Or are you saying no. that the males the would males do you harm if, if they did something to if the female? We, if, if you put fear in this woman writing on the on the on this woman CO, yeah, that, yeah. That, the, that the the male COs would punish the guy. Okay, and big they, time, they, they, big time. I ain't got to put them by, by four. Like they, might, like, they might not want the woman out there because they in, they might feel that she in the way. But they also going to protect her. That's, Got you. That's she's the prime prize and the pride of the prize. So if you fuck with her, we are gonna fuck over you real bad. Dude. Right. Here Got you. Shit. Got you. See, the way mm -hmm. I had my unit, I would go to whoever was the top of each game. You know, mm -hmm. Rainbows, Ortenos, Bloods, Cribs, and I would tell them, "Get your people." Mm -hmm. you know what I'm because right. If not, I'm just going to come audit you. you right. Know I mean? The way I handled it was. There's no need to have ego. Right. Just whoever's running it, hey, I'm about to be off for two days. Don't let them fuck yeah. up my relief. You know what I'm right. saying? I'm trying to have sex when I'm not around. Like, okay. <laughs> not I know you don't have money on your books, but you got mad. You know what I mean? So right. there's a way that you can talk. You know what I mean? Keep your people, in, keep, keep your team together. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Because I'm going to take it from the top and go down. Mm -hmm. That's how I ran my unit. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Again, my goal is just to go home. Most people who work in corrections, that's the only job they can get in law enforcement. Let's keep it real. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's the it, lowest yeah. of the lowest. It's a, it's a category three law enforcement. We're patrol is category one. You said the uh, old guy told me one time that he's been in, a cop in prison forever. And I think he wrote one guy up, and all the time he, he'd been a correctional officer, right? But he'll tell the lieutenants what to do because he's been there so long, right? Anyhow, he was telling me one day, he said this. Youngster, what youngsters are pain in the ass because they're trying to prove themselves. Yeah, you know, whoever. Huh? Yeah, that I caught this in the cell and so forth. But the youngster come out and said, "Yeah, we, we, uh, we got all this under control." And and the old cop looked at him and laughed at him, and he says, "I want to tell you something. Any time these prisoners get together and decide to take over this prison." I don't give a shit how many guns you think we got. <laughs> it ain't gonna be enough. It ain't gonna, they'll run out of bullets before you run out of inmates. <laughs> right. you know? right. They're gonna take over. Right. That's why they carry that. They got the rifle on the tier, but they carry a, a 38 on their side with a not inside. In our prison, they do. And, and with the, the levels the levels three, the levels four. All have guns. All have many 14s inside on. Inside or yeah. perimeter? No, inside. The gun <laughs> rounds. They, they got them aimed at us while we eat them. They got them aimed at us when we go to chow, leave chow, come <laughs> out and go to the yard. There's a sidearm and a mini 14 at, at all times. <laughs> when you get down to the two level, then, then it Pop guns. Then, it's, then, then you got the block gun. The, the block gun. Yeah. You know? But block guns will do nothing but just scare. They're not, they're. You they, scared, scared, scared them for something. They, they will. They sting a little bit. If they're close enough, they're going to kill you. <laughs> don't skip them. Yeah. They're going to they're gonna kill you. I was on the yard in Folsom one time, and uh, something happened on the yard. And I'm sitting on the on the wall on a bench. There's a real long bench off, off of one building. Yeah. I got this youngster out there, and he's got this damn black gun. And Sarah holding it up like this, you know. <laughs> he's got that punk like this, and he just is shaking. He just nervous <laughs> as a son of a bitch. I flagged down the sergeant and I told him. 
take that fucking gun from that punk or something's going to happen on this yard. Yeah. It's just like one time I was in a phone booth making a phone, me and a Spanish guy. Alarm went off, the cop told us to go outside and spread. Tower yeah. over here, oh, it's the Mexican right in the head. Mexicans like this on the ground. No way he was doing anything wrong but spreading. The cop didn't like him. Something happened in the yard. He blows that dude's head off, right? So I eat my ass back in that in that phone booth area. And the cop tells me, you got to go back outside. And I tell him, fuck you. I said, you ain't got a gun. You ain't telling me shit. this is the thing you know again um you you know the purpose of this because this is the thing about this conversation is to have as much insight as we can get i i you know i really because you were it sounds like a very different kind of a corrections officer right Mm -hmm. so um and for anybody that might listen to this even people who are currently officers, I want you to get them some advice about how to handle their job that can make their job better because she better for be them a, and for the inmates. He couldn't be a state officer. Who? You. I work with the state and the feds. No, I'm talking. Uh, <laughs> what do you mean? You yeah. Can't really, you okay. Can't, yeah. No, I'm saying you can't, you can't have the attitude that you got and, <laughs> and work like when we were in Folsom and stuff. Mm-hmm. No way in hell you could work. I, say work I was raised by the people who came out the prisons. Yes. I want to say something. You feel me? But when I got, I got corrections, my uncle who was doing a murder bid when he was out for a couple months and violated, sat me down with the OGs and said, "If you're going in there, this is how you <laughs> as a mother who's been in here for 20 years, let's have a you know a conversation." So I'm raised by the people who were sitting down with you guys. You know what I, mean? uh-huh. I just happened to stumble on a past and let me. <laughs> right, go ahead. And I think, uh, for fairness, what Smitty is saying, and uh, Smitty. I mean, no, I mean, Pike. 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 What Pike is saying is that back in the day, in in his era in in the eighties, yep. you know, in the seventies, mm-hmm. whatever, the seventies and eighties, it was a different <laughs> breed of people in a different mm-hmm. breed. Of, like you said, you were schooled by people who were from that hardened generation. So they laced your boots of what not to do and how not to go in that situation so that you can come out alive. Mm-hmm. And in the state is different than the feds. Yes. You know, it's, all, it's mostly because, because, yeah. because in the feds, you would be that person in the unit that can come on and say, look, man, this is how, let's get this shit together today. Feds more grown up. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not like it's more grown up. It's just... It just the, the COs don't have a gun. First, yeah. they don't have no. shit. They just, like she said, got their mouth Yeah. So yeah. it's according to how they act to how the inmates act towards it's them. Right. right. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? The state is different because it's gun ho. They got gun on certain levels. Yeah. And then you got assholes and people that's trying to pull themselves to the <laughs> next. You know, right. and trying to be a sergeant and trying to be a lieutenant. One would shoot, and, all of that and the other ones would shoot and call the other towers and ask them why they're shooting. And it was and it was different. It was it was a different liberty as well. As yeah. Now. Yeah. Because then it was gladiators. They would you know they would be right, a sport. Right, you know what I'm saying? They right. would put these dudes against solid. So, so since all of that shit has been come to see, fruition, got, they really can't do that anymore because right. you know, all of this stuff has been they've been exposed to all of the drama that the COs. Yeah, you know, they they do done a lot. Call. So I never seriously. Wait one second, Pike. Wait one second. I, wait, one second. I, I went to the fire camp. <laughs> Where they integrated all of the yards. So three, four, two, everyone was together. Right. I watched riots happen every single day where people were being shot. And it was ran by people who were old minded. And I was I went to I was the, the seventh gay person to go through gay through gay camp, gay camp. So in 2019 they just started allowing uh uh SNYs to come to camp. So when I was there every single day, it was they were throwing the Crips with the whites, with the blood, with the Mexicans. They were putting us all together, knowing, yeah, knowing it right. that it was going to be it was going to be crazy every day. Mm-hmm. And it happened every day. And the only people who got out were the people that understood the system's not working. 
right at all. <laughs> right, right. Your system's not working at all. I can't we, pay paychecks. We <laughs> have to make it work. Mm-hmm. I went there where we had 1,100 people on our yard at a time where all of their politics would hate me. Mm-hmm. But what I knew from my friend was the only way I'm going to get out of there is to get involved, education, do every single program that I can, and show them that I'm capable to get out because at the end of the day, they still have the power. Yeah. The CEOs have the power to relay a message and let them know this guy's actually working that time off. Uh-huh. I've sat there. I worked for I worked as a clerk. I worked under everyone and I saw the politics of how it worked. And it comes down to we're all people. Right. So all those people running the place, they're still showing up and this is their job. If you're horrible to them and disrespectful, they're gonna go out of the way to make it more difficult for you. They didn't send you to back of them. And, and the most part of it, that's their life. Yeah. A lot yeah. of the people that's making that their career, they ain't going nowhere. Right. Yeah. right. The princess is gonna come and go. Yeah. But the but the but the but the CEOs is the captains and yeah. they're gonna be there. Yeah. Right. So, so they're gonna make it as more comfortable for them as possible. Yeah. And, and they're gonna have the top say so. So yeah. they're gonna keep the people in there. If you a fuck up, get him out of here. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. They're gonna get people, they're gonna politic harder right. you know what I'm saying? to right. keep the people that they want there. But, and that's how but my point was that he was saying about the guns. The guys there love to use their guns. Okay. And so and that's what I saw. Uh-huh. You know, I saw the guys yeah. getting, they're like, they were looking for a reason to use everything on them. Uh-huh. And, so, and, and we, were level, we were a level one. Wow. Secure level one. Wow. Like the thing is, because we're going to camp and we have all these special programs, they had, it was a secure level one, so that gave the excuse to have four, three, and two all in one oh, yard. Uh-huh. Even though there were stabbings and all these things, but it's no one. Let's wow. See, let's see. Let's see. You gotta. You gotta remember this too. We have a lot of people in Sacramento that don't walk these yards. When they walk the yards, what they do? They shut our yards down. Mm-hmm. Cut up. Mm-hmm. Walk with the social wards. You walk with these. And I worked for a social ward at at a at a Ironwood. I worked with. Uh, custody captains and I then I went to Solano where I was a metal fab part of their motor program yeah, to put your medical vehicles. I'm the one that actually prototyped the first medical uh, transportation vehicle and started running that program with another guy, uh, uh, Rich. Me and him together put that together and started making the vehicles. But what they would do is they would take us, knowing that they looked at our background, our sheets, and say, okay, you can come out, you come to work, you come to work, but you can't come to work, you can't come to work, because they only want certain people around when they bring the politicians in mm-hmm. the middle to tell them that this is working, which mm-hmm. is not. You know what I'm saying? And then when they bring women onto the facility, the guys, they get to protect, the CEOs get the protection mode over you, when you come on, you say, "Hey, look, this is a program. This is what I want." Woo, 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 woo. But then you also get the women that you know it coming there. Yeah, that's 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 got this. Uh, the the her last boyfriend was uh, mm-hmm. King Tut to Tut. He just slapped the shit out of her. So <laughs> yeah, come to yeah. work, and that yeah. shit out of us. The best way to do that. Is yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she want me what? Yeah, <laughs> realization of this whole thing is anytime that a prisoner's going to take over prison, ain't a motherfucking thing, excuse my language, but ain't a motherfucking thing that them CEOs can do but bend over and kiss their ass goodbye. Because mm-hmm. when it when you got what, 132? I had 125 to myself every day for six years. Mm-hmm. Okay, now you got 125, 126 to yourself every day. Now you tell me that you, and these are women, are men. I've been in the feds and I've been in the state. Dude. So I know that the feds, the reason why I went to the feds because of my mind. The reason why I went to the state because of my stupidity. Everything mm-hmm. that's mental, Crimes go to the feds. Mm. Yeah, the fed, go, working on the fed yard changed me. Yeah, because I would go. I was going into work, no uniform at this point, and I'm sitting down, and I'm. They have to check in. They're starting to leave and go get jobs, and I'm sitting down with my inmates who are making twice as much in one paycheck that I'm making a month. Uh, I'm now going right back into it. 
when I had a woman who was 45 years old who looked like us, and like, why are you here? Mm -hmm. you know what I mean, oh, I was writing, I was writing papers at the college, and the the, the students were paying me. Wow. But they were paying me with the, re the reimbursement, so I got a crime for the, you know. For oh, the, wow. Like, for the wow. Loans. I'm like, so you're in here for writing papers. Wow. For college students. Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Accountants. Yes. And it was the Fed yeah. inmates that made me leave. He got me to LA, but my Fed inmates were like, ma'am, I'm going to show you how to write a, a letter of, of I'm gonna show you how to write. But I don't. Letter. But I. You know but I, mean? but, like, but I need to. I need you brilliant. to. I need you to unpack a cut because that's what I want to understand I is. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. So so. But but being my question is, I guess, being there with them. What was it that made you say, "I got to get out"? What was it? It because I. I, I don't... Well, you you develop a relationship. You know, every week they're coming in, they're sitting down. I mean, what are your goals? What are your dreams? Uh -huh. Thomas, you're funny. I'm like, yeah, I'm, one day I'm going to do some stand up comedy, just talking. Right. I can develop a right. NPC relationship uh -huh. without being personal. Right. But if I see you every day, what's up, big dog? What you want today? Right. What you want today? You know? Right. Just, but if, I, if I'm sitting here talking to him every day and I know he's got a skill set, tell me about your skill set. Tell me about how you do that. You know? uh -huh. Explain to me. You're brilliant at this. And I want to know why you're so good at it, but why did you end up using it for bad? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But you start developing a relationship with your with your population, especially at this level when it's personal. You know, I'm giving mm -hmm. you passes to go home. Yeah, got gotcha. you. Know what I'm, I'm helping you get your birth certificate, I'm putting you on a bus for the first time, uh -huh. uh, and just talking. And head. it just made you. Was it that it was it that you you didn't want to continue in that process, or was it more? Okay, I can go make some more money somewhere else, or what? What was what made me leave? Yeah, transition? yeah. Oh, I wasn't fulfilled. Okay, I got I you. Be, I mean, I would be, I would be happy when they transitioned and went home, but there was like, I'm a big personality. Got you. Know you. I mean? It's hard for me to come and sit in a cubicle every day. Right. You know what I mean? You tell me I can't leave except to go to lunch. I'm an right. interactive person. Uh huh. You know what I mean? It, it's got you. And the conversation always goes outside of what we're supposed to talk to because sure. I'm, I genuinely well you're interested. a person yeah right you're yeah. curious yeah you yeah you <laughs> yeah, yeah you right know, yeah yeah right. yeah right. yeah did what do what mm -hmm. like, let's stop oh, yeah you know, <laughs> yeah we, we to check in. two hours later i'm like so right. you were eight right said, you know <laughs> yeah 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 I was, I was, I was I was like you oh, but but been to be a yo it was a moment in time, right? Transitioned out of it, uh -huh. but it was a very important. It, it just changed me because it would help a lot more people that's in there to calm down to want to come home. Man, I'm crying, you know, I'm like, man. like because you're behind the walls, don't mean that you can't come that's home. Great. You don't want to do it different when you do come home. You do that. That's you great. need something you inside of that kind of place. You do need a personality like yours. Yeah, yeah. You, you need that to give that person a little bit of hope. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I wish all of them were like you. But but then yeah, you'll get one. Like this, that's sensible. And to one, you got 30 over here. And you're going to have all the officers so. that work with her. They're going to get on her for being they, so. Yeah, they're going to be so. They're all mothers, all. Right. So I do, I do want to say something about that. So we yeah. had, when I was in Jamestown, we had a girl that came on the yard. I was there for six months. Their program there is for you to be there for three months and then you go off the queue. Okay. So your physical training is great. I stayed and I was a peer mentor, a, a, a tutor, and I worked with the water. And we had one girl come onto the yard who was helped us get the AA up and running. She helped us get that because the pandemic everything got shut down. So we right. got anger management, we got fatherhood. NAAA ran up in two days, which are wow. Now. Within two weeks, all the male CEOs had voted out. Wow. Because everyone was all of a sudden, all the classes were full. Uh -huh. And everyone was getting credit. Uh huh. And things were running smoothly. So they, they're like, oh, well, maybe we don't need nine COs on the yard. Uh, uh huh. And so that meant, so that, right, so, right. Job security, so right. That's police. Then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of a sudden the crypt door was open. The white door was randomly unlocked. The, all, the, all the people who like to fight, all of a sudden, all their doors were unlocked for lunch. And uh -huh. there was big riot, and everything got shut down, and she was gone. Uh-huh. Yeah, see, so this is how, and I, I need, and I know you needed to say something too. I know that a uh, um a lot of people listening, they don't understand, especially if you've never been in the system like this, 
how the system does things to um, to break down. Uh, one that I, I never liked about it being an instructor in a prison is that um, it's the psychological warfare for me that was always so unnecessary. That was the worst of it. Being physically detained and told what you can do and what you can't do are bad enough. But it was the psychological, the unnecessary, like when you say how the female officer, when they get mad or whatever, and then they're coming and tear up your stuff and do all these things, but that's for psychological control. And, and then they would do things like what you're saying to that would tear down. They had a warden that came in to CIW and she came in and all of a sudden just shut down all yard activity for no reason. Like just, she just can't, it's like, okay, well then what, what's the point, you know? And so, and when you and when you do that, you create um, more mental distress. You create a whole lot of things that were just unnecessary. And the taxpayer, like you always say, Pike, the taxpayer, if they had any idea what was going on, they would not support what's being done. But but society has been told to believe <laughs> that number one that that if you are in prison, it's a couple of things. One, you stupid. Number two, that you deserve to be there. Um, and then they then they dehumanize you by the fact that you have been convicted of something. And once that's why whenever there's a conversation about police brutality, the first thing they start looking for law enforcement or media starts looking for is has this person ever been involved with the system? Because once they can say you committed a crime, then you're no longer human. And I no longer have to acknowledge that this system is wrong. And that this is somehow a problem. So it's really um, important for people listening to understand this is not just one experience. What, what he's talking about, Jonathan is talking about, is happening system-wide in all of the prisons and all over the country where um, they cre do things. And you always talk about this, and then I'm going to have you talk about it, is, is the lockdown boxes, yeah. right? And he talks about this where... Every year they knew at a certain period of time that there was going, they were going on lockdown because the COs would make sure something happened. Why? Because they needed overtime money. And so they would create scenarios, like you say, unlocking certain doors, doing certain things so that there can be trouble so that then they can get more. Or a bullet to come up lost. Right. Oh my gosh. When that happened at CIW. No, when when it, oh yeah, everything. Oh, the lost bullet. Oh my gosh, that happened at CIW. But wait, but let me tell you. But wait, let me tell you what happened at CIW. What was really messed up is not only was it lost bullets, but parts of the gun was found in places too, buried in places on them yards. It was it was a mess. It was a mess. You're saying about the the ego with the officers from the perspective of an officer. We knew who those officers were. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? There was yeah. always somebody who was, who am I on a shift with today? You know, who would do extra during the searches, who would take all the property and stuff it in the pillowcase. We knew who the officers were. You know what I mean? Everybody knew who it was. And the inmates usually took care of them one eventually. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. as, as an officer, we was like, they're going to get theirs one day. Even the officers were saying that. Mm -hmm. um, my last year and a half, I worked in hospital duty. Mm -hmm. Um, so I gave witness four births, mm. C-section. Mm. Um, I was there for two people passing. Mm -hmm. I watched them pass away. Um, and we got a lawsuit while I was at the hospital because one of the officers handcuffed a pregnant inmate mm. in the back. And mm. because of that, the rule changed that you can no longer handcuff a pregnant woman right. from the back. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we always knew the officers who had a little bit too much ego. You know what I mean? But for the large majority, we were all mothers. We're all like, we, you know, we're, we're just normal. We go home. You know what I mean? Like we pack lunches. Like it's literally just the, the, the you know big I mean? difference. And the women, they have families. Yeah. Right. They're stud right. granddaddy. Right. You know, stud mom, dad. Right. They, they, and they're very open about it. And right. They share. We'd have Norenos and Serenos hooking up. Women don't care. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's, emotional, but it's emotional and it's messy and it's high school and it's it's a different type of stress level. I'd rather be fake. And this is something I want to say because this is an experience that I had doing gang intervention on the street. Um, law enforcement. I worked. I was working in Watts, and because of their uh, them having projects, various projects, 
their gangs were pretty much divided by projects. Right. So um, I'm in Jordan Downs one day, and once you've been around the environment enough, you begin to you could feel it in the air. You know, you know when something is something is yeah. brewing. Moves, something is happening. Ass. Something or either it's not moving, right? Yeah. Something something is up. Right, quick. right. You learn. So I'm like, hey, what's happening? Well, they told us that this group said they was gonna come over here and kill all the women and children. And I said, before you do anything, I just want to ask you this question. Before you committed a crime, have you ever gone to law enforcement and told them in advance what you was about to do? Have you ever done that? No. I said, well, we'll make you think they would let law enforcement know what they was going to do in advance. I got this. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. What the hell? Wait, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. And I was told like a month later, you saved a lot of lives that day. But just by asking a simple question, if you never went and told law enforcement what you was about to do in advance, why would they do that? And and it was for the same benefit. It was for the benefit of law enforcement to keep stuff going. It was in their best interest mm -hmm. for them to have conflicts in that area because that was overtime. It was job security. It was more bodies on, on duty and things like that. So the you know, there's a lot of things we even had. One of the things I think the Watts Gang Task Force was most famous for was getting rid of um, two officers, having them transferred. And literally within the time after they transferred, within two years, violent crime in the area had reduced by more than 50 percent. And yeah. it was and then they one of the guys he told um he told the girl, yeah, my bosses are not gonna be happy that I'm moving. Well, you know he wasn't talking about LAPD bosses. He was talking about whoever he was working for and whatever he was doing in that neighborhood that allowed it. And so it kept a lot going to the point where they were just transferred, which is something that happens regularly within LAPD, but they sued the department to get put back into Watts. Yeah. And Listen. one of them was put back into Watts and the other one wasn't the one who was the main problem never did get back into Watts, but it just tells you anybody with a brain knows there was something going on. They was making too much money. Right. They was making right. a lot of money in Watts, keeping the chaos going and whatever it was that they were doing. So a lot of times society isn't aware of just how much behind the scenes trying to perpetuate the stereotypes, the violence, the crime, all of those things that go on because it feeds the system. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give everybody a chance for some final comments, and then we're going to close it out for the night. And I'm going to start with you, sir. She's a violent person, and I want it on record. <laughs> Who is she? Who is she? You. Who is she? Oh, the, the, the she would be me? Yeah. You should put yourself out there. Just leave that she. Okay, well, whoever she is, huh? Look, yeah, she sure is. Look, she sure is. Look, yes, ma'am. Tonight was a very uh, eye-opening. Once again, I'm happy you were here. I thought that I would be, like, aggravated, but you were so open. You were so honest, and like I said, I wish all correctional officers would like you to make <laughs> their transition a little bit better. Yeah, because you're already in a place you don't want to be. And I'm not saying okay, uh, they didn't do nothing wrong, but I'm already somewhere I don't want to be. But yeah. I just wish everybody could like Thank you, sir. Glad I never did. Then there's another. There was another great moment in our discussion about love and respect. It's a conversation that I really wish the entire society and in fact the world would understand that love and respect for people as a human, just as a human being, will produce better results than almost anything else. Love will conquer all, but it's about respect and uh, this gentleman uh, who's in this segment, he will talk about his experience and how him being respectful and sharing love with hardened criminals of all persuasions overcame any obstacles that he had while he was doing 
uh, time. And the reason he was incarcerated, you'll hear him talk about, he was an addict and he didn't say specifically what happened, but his incarceration was the result of him being in a, having an addiction, which lots of people wind up incarcerated for that. And he was terrified, but because he had a friend who was the former corrections officer, she could explain to him what he needed to do to survive the institution. And so that was an incredible discussion uh, that I'd like for you to, to take a look at. Oh, Lord. Now he's growling. No, but seriously, I wasn't going to come because my disdain for CDC and CDCR goes down to my ball because it's I have brothers stuffed in there. It's not my blood, but they're my brothers. And it's white, black, Oriental, Filipino. You know, I made friends with a lot of a lot of cats from different races. And the perpetual understanding that CDC are fruit is a, is a con game. They tell y'all we kind artists. Really, the con game is CDC and CDCR. That's why they went from CDC to CDCR, so they can run it up, run a tab, and file bankruptcy. We all know that. But wait, I want, and but, I want to stop right there and say that's not really true. Then I had a, I had a great opportunity in this discussion tonight to brag on the work of my brother, the late Reverend Eugene Williams III. I'm going to try not to cry. He was the foremost person in re-entry in the country when he passed away in March of 2012. He started working on re-entry issues in 1988 when they didn't even have a term for it. But part of this discussion also was me correcting misinformation that was stated by one of the former inmates about why the department, California Department of Corrections put the R, which is for California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, why that R was put back into the name. It was there, it was taken away for a time, and it was put back. The former inmate thought that it was be, it was a monetary thing, and I said, no, that was the work of my brother and all the people that he trained in the state of California to advocate on behalf of the inmate population to make things better for them so that they were more prepared for reentry. It's a fascinating discussion. Um, and as is true with all of our all of our conversations, it was absolutely some hilarious moments in there. And I can't wait for you to see that as well. True. I, the only reason I know that that's not true is because my brother was the advocate that made them put the, the, the rehabilitation back in and made them start doing things and, they took it out. and, provide, and, they took, and providing programming and stuff. And they and, took it out. So I'm just telling you. But, but, that, they, the but it, at that point, they never worked. But this is the thing. But 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 they had to at least give, which is why now they have the, the credits for, for participating in all those programs and stuff that they didn't have. I'm telling you, I know, I just know that one thing to be true. Because look, I'm about calling a spade a spade. And if it was My about giving their money, I would say that. But I'm just telling you, I know I the know. work that we they did on the us. outside. So they feed us food that's not supposed to be for consumed by humans. Oh, absolutely. Listen, and I'm not defending them. Please they believe. Full of shit. They are. And please believe. You I understand that. But what I'm just saying is... I'm only just saying this. When it's when you write, you write, but I know I know the effort that was put in to advocate for them to require rehabilitation. I know the effort and the work that were, were was put in by a lot of advocates and a lot of churches on the outside to require CDC to become CDCR again because of the fact that it was advocated for. For example, you can't be a young inmate now and go in there without it and not have a GED. Now it's a mandate that you must get a GED. Why did we advocate for that? We advocated for that because we know that without a high school diploma or an equivalent, there's no job you can get when you come out. So we advocated that while they're on 
in in the prison that on their dime that they have to provide that and make that accessible to, to them. And that's not to say that that it is is actually working. It's just that at least um, it is a mandate. And if you want it on your own, it is available to yeah. you. Where before well, we, it may not have been available because we did. It is a law. But guess what? This is the deal. That's even proof of what I just said. Okay. <laughs> So I don't care. He can be mad. He's going to be mad at me either way. I have, I'm in a no-win situation with this one right here. I'm not even trying to win with him anymore. Uh, Jonathan. You don't love me no more? You or him. What, can, can we let our guests have, yeah. have so, any final thoughts? I actually, I, I did a lot of programming while I was there, and Christina actually helped me walk through a lot of how to start out. So I got my GED. I did three years. I did three college classes. I just did a year and a half off my and in three months, and and, and in tutoring, um, church, church, in that I made friends with both lifers who were all the game readers. So in that we brought in uh, water treatment, which is a, fi a five tier program. Which as they get released, they can get a job and get started up in the grand. Wow! I helped thirty guys get their certificates in the six months I was there, and so I. The program in the in the fear that I had of prison, I just I got in the program itself, and and through AA and I experienced that to give it up to God and just right give. So the guys that hated me and gave me dirty looks every day, I too, uh -huh. you know. So right. I, I flipped the situation oh, yeah. with, with love and respect. Yes, absolutely. I understood that being gay was uncomfortable for a lot of them, but. I didn't make it their issue. I just came with lots of respect. And even some of the COs, because the COs get it. Sure, of course, right. So, and, 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 and me making an uncomfortable situation open and seeing the people that are in the country. Having a conversation. Because I was aware of what the situation was, I knew that all I could do was just come with respect and love. Mm -hmm. Because I couldn't relate in so many ways, but what I did relate was that I was an addict mm -hmm. and I almost killed myself and brought mm -hmm. which I think a lot of people would think. Right. So I, what I did was I tried to find the common ground mm -hmm. rather than the difference. So I just wish that you would uh, teach the whole society. Okay, can I get you? Can I get you to just write the whole? You, you know what I'm saying? Like I just need him. I need him to write that whole formula down for everybody because look, we're gonna have differences and it's gonna be uncomfortable. And I don't have to like your choices. I, I don't give a damn who you sleep with. It, that's just me. You know what I'm saying? So we don't want to go home, right? Right. And everybody at the end of the day wants to go home, but that's literally. There, there are two things. Respect is is key, but what it is is you had to treat them like humans, and then they begin to treat you like yeah, a human. Love, and love, love, yeah, love is going to oh, it's going to conquer so yeah, many yeah, things. Yeah. It's going to conquer so many things. So that's so yeah. powerful, and I'm so glad that you're here to share that. Um, and I'm hopeful that anybody that may come across this may hear that message um, if they go into prison afraid and whatever. That it may help them to, yeah. to you see what I'm saying? Because, because the, the most unlikely people were the ones that reached out. See, the, every gang leader, uh -huh. you know, because they were like, "I want to go." Okay, right, <laughs> right. It's a common <laughs> shit. It's a common <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The politics and the fantasy, like yeah, whatever. Fun. But at the end of the day, mm. Mm. To my family mm. is pretty nice. Mm. Amen. Mm. How about that? <laughs> Last comments from you, sir. I just want to know, first of all, thank you for putting this platform can, can, out here. Can, can, they're not going to be able to hear him because I Man. just made a comment. That's all. I want, like I said, I want to make, I want to uh, give you kudos for making this platform available. Thank you. I want to give Jonathan his props for, for being open and transparent mm -hmm. and speaking his truth. You know, Pike for always giving his opinion <laughs> and, you know, his, his experience. <laughs> Brother for always giving his experience. Sister putting in a time, I want to definitely give her her props, Christina, for coming here because there's not too many seals that's going to come and tell the truth about the situation and how the system is a well oiled machine and it's, it is it is focused to stir up bullshit and keep bullshit yeah. going yeah. and propaganda and how 
the CDC, change from the CDC to the CDR to put programs in there to help some people go home that want to go home because at the end of the day, you got to have it up here and want to yeah. take your ass home. Yeah. So I don't give a fuck what program is in place, what program is not in place. You got to have the ability and the mindset to say, fuck this shit, I want to go home. Mm-hmm. They bring on programs that I could take and help me go home. Fuck that, fuck this, need a kickback, I'm going home. Right. It's the mindset. Right. It's not mm-hmm. about the CEO. It's not about the prison because the system is a well oiled machine and it's there to destroy people and to break people. Yes. But you have to be strong enough in the mind to say, you know what? Fuck that. I want to go home. Mm-hmm. And this is how I'm going to do it. I don't care if you're gay, straight, white, black. Bro, I'm trying to get home. Mm-hmm. And for this young lady to come here and speak her truth about the system, she got heart because it's people that would want to send her death threats because of she oh, giving yeah. this type of information up and being the light-spirited person that she is. I ran into a lot of CEOs in the feds that were like her. And guess what? They got removed from the yard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah. because they didn't want to see transparency, people elevating people to be something. You know, they right. were de- you know a, lot of, a lot of CEOs are dehumanized. Mm-hmm. And they desensitized. And they're machines. Mm-hmm. And they more machines than people that's interest. They mm-hmm. doing worse time because they so fucking miserable. Yes. You know what yes. I'm saying? So they try to spill that misery onto people that's in prison, whether it be the right. state or the fed. This is the mentality. Yep. Their mentality is more fucked up than the person who wants to go home it because is. they're free and coming to a yes. jail to get a bullshit job right. and, a check and a stir of bullshit when this person is in prison trying to go home. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Probably got better skill sets than them, right. smarter than them. Got love from their family, and they want the hottest person still filled with this love and this passion, but they got all the time. Right. So I want to definitely commend you for coming and speaking your truth. You know what I mean? Because like I said, yeah, and it definitely, you know, because it is needed. You know, and, and having a mindset, that's why I wrote this book right here, because it's about understanding and have a formula to succeed. You know what I'm saying? No matter where you are in your life, you got to put your form together that's for you. So there's no cookie cutter in life that's going to apply to everyone. And I need you know to I mean? and I need to say right here also is that we're going to talk about uh, Terrell's book next week. That's our topic next week is the formula for success. I want everybody to understand that when we did the first interview with Mr. Terrell and his son, um, it got more views than any video that we've ever put up. So I don't want you, anybody out there to miss it. Uh, that when we put his, when we do his video, expect it to be powerful and enlightening, and expect him to uh, to set it on fire. He gonna bring it like he did the last time. And and so we're just thankful. And I wanna um, I wanna give the two gentlemen, uh, Otis, any last comments from you, sweetie? Otis. Wake up, uh, you guys uh, a, good, a lot of good stuff. Um, education for the inmates was a really good topic, but you left out all the corruption and uh, uh, stuff the inmates were in part of, but the correction officers were making thousands and thousands of dollars selling in, uh, cell phones and narcotics to inmates. He's a corruption. Oh, I've had four or five of my. My CEO friends get fired for sneaking cell phones in. We had an inmate get pregnant. It gets deep. They had 17 not- police officers, 17 correctional officers out of the solid dad getting arrested for bringing in cell phones, marijuana, heroin, all kinds of drugs. And, and uh, so you, they're trying to uh, rehabilitate the inmates. They need to be rehabilitated. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Steffens, last comments. Yes, I'd like to say, Ms. Christina, uh, thank you for your insight and that you had a different approach than our uh, lady officer that I had met in San Quentin and Pelican Bay. And I would just only say, if some of the women that was th- that was in institutions were kind of like you were, were a person that just wanted to come in and do a job and go home. And the women that I I was uh, 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 introduced to in prison was the uh, male gun ho type of women. And uh, I never saw one as I listened and witnessed to the way you were. And uh, I think that's a good approach. If they would, uh, if it would just carry on to that and what the gentleman said, a lot of people just want to go home and they want to be treated decent and they want to be treated fairly. 
Thank you, Miss Lorraine. Absolutely. And I'm going to give you some final words. It was a pleasure to be here. To share my perspective, um, what I did learn live, working in the prison system, I'm just one of a huge population in a huge system that's already in play. And if I can just make a difference with one or two people, then that's my goal to get home and make a difference with the people that I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, everybody does their time their way, just like every CEO does their time their way. I was extremely institutionalized when I moved out here. It took me like two years not to tap the side of my pants for keys or stand <laughs> with my back to the wall. I still carry those effects of being in the prison. Today. I'm too, don't worry about yeah, I'm I'm still here with it every, every day. Time I hear keys, I, I you know what I mean? Door knob, but but. It, it's an honor to share my perspective of my experience. I, my life was not designed for me to be a CEO. My life was designed for me to be an inmate. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, from the early yeah. ages. Yeah. So the fact that I was able to go through that system, learn, come out with a new perspective, I think that my next stage is to share that. It's my first time like sitting and sharing it outside of like being on a TV show with segments, but I like, and I think it's important. Um, and I really, really appreciate it. I'm glad I didn't irritate you. I'm glad you- And this is the thing. <laughs> so, so this is what I want to say to you guys. Um, One of the things too is that um, I want everybody listening to understand this. Uh, We're going to be doing a, a series um, and my, even on the short film that I'm working on, um, we're going to be doing a series and we're, what, what the goal is, is to tell the stories of, um, former inmates and things, but number one, to pay them for their story, but number two, um, to give them an opportunity to train in the jobs behind the camera, um, so that they may get careers because the entertainment industry doesn't care that you have a criminal background. So for me, so for me, um, that is why I intend to do this program. And this is what sparked the conversation when I was explaining it to Christina with our bougie friend, our bougie <laughs> colleague, and Christina overheard me telling her, no, you're gonna have to get over that because we're gonna be doing a show and you're gonna have to produce it and you're gonna have to get over dealing with the population. Right. So this is something, this is again, um, I taught introduction to the entertainment industry for two semesters at CIW. And then that's right before the warden came in and put everybody out and stopped all yard activity and everything. And so um, this is something, my thing is, my love is construction in the entertainment industry. And my passion is to help people like, like me who had to deal with the ravages of incarceration by being fall, having fallen in love with somebody who had been incarcerated. Um, I had to deal with the, the, the side effects of incarceration. I had to deal with his issues when he came home and everything. And the one thing that I found out is I was so busy worried about his issues that I wasn't worried about who was taking care of my issues, which was a major problem. And that's something. So for this year coming up, we're going to spend a lot more time talking about um, my book. I'm going to be reading to you guys and we'll be using it as the topic of discussion. Hurt People Highway, which is available on Amazon. I also wrote um, Living Authentically You, um, Five Steps to Personal Peace, um, because it matters what you entertain and how you can move forward. And I'm just so grateful. Um, I can never thank you enough for being here. Um, and I'm so excited. And I can't wait to see my man next week. Um, this is really exciting because I get to see him two weeks in a row. <laughs> hey, look how. That makes me happy. Okay. I love you guys. See you guys again. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube channel. Check us out and we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye. So this was a wonderful discussion as all of our discussions are. And I hope that you enjoy our uh, discussion tonight. I hope you learned something as always. And as always, we're free to heal. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all platform, social media platforms. I encourage you to leave comments, any, dis any topics that you may want us to discuss. By all means, please feel free 
to uh, leave those comments and we'll try to get to all of it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you next week. Again, this is Noreen McClendon for Free to Heal and we'll talk to you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.